in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from our four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this from, a, from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is, it is near right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, with each, with each with their assigned task, and tells one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everything. Uh, I say to everyone, watch. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So uh, these are exciting passages. And uh, the passage that, that Larry read today, I uh, just want to let you know, this is a two-part message. I thought I'd get through that whole passage, um, but there's just there's just too much. And so this is a two-part message this week and, and next week. So just be aware of that. I know you looked at the outlines. If you look at them going, wow, a lot there. Yeah, there's a lot there. I just want to make sure that we, um, uh, we as we said about last week, that we understand this passage in context with the other synoptic gospels, Matthew and Luke, as well, and make sure we interpret scripture, interpret scripture, so we have a good understanding of what Jesus is, is saying here. Before we get into verse 24, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we um, uh, read these words today, God, and, and study them, we desire to be encouraged by the truths contained therein. Father, these words are, are so appropriate for us today, at, even as they were in the day that you gave them, God. Uh, the, the world is messy, and, uh, and it's, it's going to get more messy. But yet, uh, there is an end when you come in glory. And Father, we want to kind of look at these uh, scriptures and remind us of the great promise that one day you will come in the clouds of glory, and everything will be okay. So God, uh, may your scripture come alive to us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we've been uh, moving through Mark 13, the Olivet Discourse, and uh, up until this point, we've, uh, I think, established that Jesus has been answering two questions. Uh, when would the temple be destroyed? What would the sign of the temple being destroyed? And the second question disciples asked would be, when are you going to come again, Jesus? And so the first uh, part of Mark 13, up and through verse 23, Jesus has been answering the first question. When would the temple be destroyed? And now he's about to move on to the second question. When will you return again? And remember, in the disciples' mind, they did not see the gap between the first event and the second event. They thought they would happen one after another. We know now that there is many years in between. And Jesus does actually allude to that if you read carefully, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, that there would be a great time. And we're going to look at a passage in Luke that indicates that as well. So Jesus moves on to answering the, the second question. So let's look at how Jesus answers that second question. Jesus, when will be the, what will be the sign when you come again in glory? Because uh, if Jesus is going to give them some sort of sign, um, some indication of when things will be winding down, then we, we might want to be aware of that. Um, so Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, let me just jump to Luke because it kind of gives us a little bit of help in understanding uh, Mark 13, 24. Luke says this, and it, it happens at the same point in the Olivet Discourse that it happens in Mark, so same timeline, but Mark doesn't include this, whereas Luke does. This is verse 24 from Luke chapter 21. It says, they will fall by the edge of the sword. He's talking about the destruction of, of Jerusalem, the temple. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles 
until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And so the Gospel of Luke, we have Jesus indicates that the temple would be destroyed, Jerusalem would be destroyed, and then there would be a time of the Gentiles, whatever that is, where Jerusalem would be trampled underfoot by foreign armies, foreign people, occupiers, etc., 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 and there would be a, a time until the second question begins to be answered. And so Jesus indicates that one day, as he begins to answer the second question, after the times of the Gentiles, and by the way, that's what we're in right now, right? Jesus has not come yet, despite what some cults have said. Jesus has not come. Um, we're in the times of the Gentiles. Most of us here being Gentiles ourselves, thank you, Jesus, for the times of the Gentiles where we can be saved. Number one, Jesus will come in power and in glory. Okay. Notice what Jesus talks about in his precursor to that, verse 24 and 25. We've got to kind of work through these things. I'm not going to come to a complete conclusion today regarding these verses because it would just take too long. But if you're interested in what I really think outside of the general teaching here, then you can ask me afterwards about it. Let me read verse 24 to 25. Jesus begins to transition here, and I'll show you why. Verse 24, but in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So how do we know a transition has occurred? How do we know that Jesus has gone from question one to question two? Well, he uses some things in the original language that we really don't get in Greek. The first thing he says there is the word but. But in those days. The word actually is following after. And they, put, they put the word but. But following after those days. And in NIV puts following that distress to kind of... Uh, to give you a little bit more uh, understanding to it. Following after refers to a sequence of events. After a certain sequence of events, again, no time is indicated, uh, there will be a transition. So Jesus is saying, following the destruction of the temple and following those days, right? What, what are those days? Well, I think they're what Luke refers to as the times of the Gentiles. So following the destruction of Jerusalem and the time that follows afterwards, there will be a time of tribulation and distress, and it will continue to the end mm -hmm. until the final event happens after that. So what Jesus is saying, he's now transitioned. Following those days, following the time when the temple is destroyed, once you see the temple is destroyed, there's going to be a transition now. Now we're moving into a time of tribulation, the time of the Gentiles, where things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until the end comes. And by the way, worse and worse and worse, I don't mean it's kind of doing like this. It could be doing this stuff, right? Up and down, I think there's times of peace too. But it's increasingly getting worse and worse and worse. And then, after that time is when this crazy cosmic stuff will happen. That verse is 24. But in those days, following that distress, following the times of the Gentiles, the sun will be darkened, etc. So the crazy cosmic stuff, we read these verses and we go, that's really interesting. The sun will be darkening, and, and the moon will not give its light. Stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. How, how do we understand those verses? How do we understand the verses that seem to indicate there's going to be this great cosmic upheaval right before Jesus comes? Jesus uses this language, and so do other writers in the New Testament, because it's used in the Old Testament to indicate the end times or eschatological uh, imagery. And so, so whenever you see these, this type of language, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give us light, that type of stuff, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, it's always talking about the times of the very end. It's this prophecy about the times of the very end. And so this sort of language is often used in the Old Testament by the prophets who use such language to describe the events leading up to the end. And so the first thing you need to understand about the language is it's talking about events that are leading right up to the end. This is probably the sign that Jesus has indicated is a sign that's going to happen before he comes. So let me just give you some of uh, those verses from the uh, Old Testament. This is from Joel 3. Notice the same sort of language. The sun and moon are darkened. The stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. And then from Isaiah 13. For the stars of the heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising, and the moon will not shed its light. 
So it's often this image of, of the end times. We see it in the Exodus and, the, and judgment. One of the judgments upon Egypt was darkness, right? It was this whole idea of dark and foreboding right up until the end. Um, Jesus is using this imagery, just like the Old Testament prophets did, in a context that is, has to do with the final fulfillment of all things, especially God's coming judgment. Uh, we see that the New Testament writers also understood it in the same way. This is from 2 Peter 3.10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Uh, from Revelation, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. It was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. The stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Um, so, most commentators uh, see some sort of cosmic event that will happen before Jesus returns again. Uh, from these verses, the extent of that upheaval can't be determined by the language. There's a lot of guessing, right? Stars falling from the heaven are meteorites and blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of guessing, but we really don't really know what these verses really mean. It lies someplace between figurative and hyperbole. It's definitely not literal, right? Because if stars were to fall to the earth, it would mean utter destruction, right? We all know what a star is. It's like the sun. It would mean that the earth doesn't long exist. And these are events that precede the coming of Jesus, not that happens after the coming of Jesus, right? So if Jesus is coming to earth and the sun hits the earth, or suns hit the earth, there is no earth to Jesus. So it has to be figurative, at least in some, some sense. So if you want to know where I'm heading towards in this interpretation, you can ask me afterwards. A little bit controversial, um, and I'm really not settled in it, so I don't want to preach it from the pulpit, but this is where I think what I think it means. But most commentators would say there's some sort of cosmic event that will happen at the end of time. So whatever it is, the essence is, the earliest Christian perspective was that the entire period between Jesus' birth and his second coming would be a constant period of tribulation. There would be constant tribulation, and it would increase until the end. Some people believe there's a seven-year period of great tribulation, or some people believe there's just an increasing tribulation. Both of those are orthodox beliefs. I don't think the scripture is ultimately clear in that, though I do lean one way uh, rather than the other. Um, whatever it is, you can, as long as we can agree that Jesus' perspective and the perspective of the New Testament is that there will be an increasing tribulation up until the end when Jesus finally returns. And the end will be like no other time in history. It won't be like just a Jerusalem destruction. It won't be like an Antiochus Epiphanes destruction of the temple. It won't be a Roman destruction. Um, those are all partial fulfillments of what will happen completely at the end when Jesus is revealed with the coming of the clouds of glory. So uh, whatever that cosmic event looks like, and even if it is a cosmic event, we can talk about that after, afterwards, uh, if you want. There is something going to happen that's ne been, that never happened before to the extent that it's ever happened before. The second thing that's going to happen that Jesus indicates right after that time where the sun is darkened and whatever that means, there will be a visible return of Jesus. Verse 26. At that time, again, at that time now refers to the cosmic event passages, right? When the sun is darkened and the moon turns red. At that time, People will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Um, it's clear, and it's clear for a number of reasons, not only there, but it's clear in other passages as well. At that time, again, is a time immediately following the cosmic stuff. Again, so the cosmic stuff cannot be the end of all things because it is preceding the making of the new heavens and the new earth. It comes before that, right? Cosmic stuff, Jesus returns, then new heavens and new earth, right? So don't get those confused. And remember, when Jesus uses the Son of Man here, the way he uses it throughout the Gospel of Mark it indicates not only his humanity, but also his divinity. And so he uses the term here again because they're looking at the Son of Man as he's preaching it, and he's also indicating 
what this will look like, and he brings it all together. The Son of Man, who identifies himself as a human, is coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's descriptive of God himself. So Jesus is making an overt claim here to not only his humanity, but also his divinity as well. And he will be revealed in his totality as that, that Son of Man. So the question is, who will see Jesus when he comes again? What does it mean the people will see the Son of Man? The they, or the, the word is translated in the NIV, people, they means everyone. Everyone will see Jesus. So I, don't, I don't want to get too technical here, but the indefinite plural there, if you, if, you're a, a, um, if you love grammar, which I don't, will see, that term will see, is often used in Aramaic in the simple passive, which is translated like this. And then the Son of Man will be seen. It's kind of hard to put that in the verse and still make sense. But the literal translation is, and then the Son of Man will be seen. It doesn't say who, because the assumption is, will be seen by everyone. Again, at this time, the disciples are going, how is that, how is that even possible? How can everyone around the known world see Jesus? Right? Now, it's pretty easy, isn't it, right? We have, we get the internet and we get TV and anything that happens localized, and I don't even know if it is localized, um, will be seen worldwide. When he comes, he will be seen. Uh, he will be visible to all, just like was promised to the disciples at the ascension. Let me remind you what that ascension narrative, this is from Acts chapter one, let me read 26 again. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Remember the promise. It's from Acts chapter 1. Jesus is speaking. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Times of the Gentiles. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud, and while they were watching, they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Notice that the word heaven is used. They're not two clouds, right? There's something else going on rather than white puffy clouds. Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go in the clouds. Jesus will be seen one day coming in the clouds with power and glory. Don't picture white puffy clouds. It's the, and it's spelled wrong in your outline. It's not shine, it, uh, it's Shekinah, S-H-E-K-I-N-A. The Shekinah glory cloud always in the Old Testament indicated the presence of God in glory. That's the clouds he's coming in. Let me read, read just a few passages in the Old Testament with that cloud appears in Exodus 24, 16. The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses from the midst of the cloud. Remember that passage, what's going on in that cloud? Thunder, lightning. Every time it, the peals of thunder came out, the people hid their face in fear because the presence of God was there. This is not Jesus kind of doing you know, the, the Renaissance thing on the white puffy cloud with a blue flowing robe. That's not what's going on here. He's coming in power and in glory. And for some of us, it'll be a wonderful day. For others, a terrifying day. <clears throat> Isaiah 4, 5. Then the Lord will create over the whole area of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day, even smoke, and the brightness of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory will be a canopy. Again, a, can a canopy of clouds. So when Jesus comes again, a visible return, you're not going to miss it. It's in power and in glory. Where it's just going to be this cloud where his presence is. And now, again, remember, Jesus is still in the body. The scars are still there. So he's still the God-man. But he's coming with, the, with this idea of this glory that in, in, in enfolds him so much that uh, people like Isaiah might have to turn away from, from that. Uh, so he talks about the timing with this cosmic event. He talks about his visible return in glory as a son of man. And then he talks about the gathering that will happen. Verse 27. And he will send his angels, that he is Jesus, and Jesus will send his angel to gather his elect 
from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Jesus here mentions only part of the gathering because that's the part that was relevant to the disciples' question. The reality is there's two gatherings that happen. Let me read from you of Matthew 13 where Jesus talks about the gathering and both gatherings that happened. And uh, if you want to ask me about this passage and how it re relates to 2 Thessalonians and being caught with Jesus in the air, you can talk to me about that too afterwards. There's a lot of stuff here, but we'll get to that. Uh, it's Matthew 13. The harvest, at the, the harvest, Jesus says, is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. There's a connection there. His angels will gather. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. There is a gathering of weeds, and there is a gathering of wheat. Both are gathered when Jesus comes again. Jesus is going to send out the angels who do the harvest work for all the stuff that we're doing right now, proclamation of the gospel. One day, all the words we speak, all the actions we do, all the proclamation of the gospel will have fruit. Right? We might not see it now. It might seem like it's just not happening. But there will be a harvest, and that harvest will, will be of good and of bad. Revelation tells us this. This is a promise. Hang on to this. Revelation 7. After this I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, every tribe, people, and language. You're there. You're, you're, you're there. That's not just other people. You're there. Which no one could remember. Standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Excuse me. And they were robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. When Jesus comes again, it will be a time for both final salvation and final judgment. Both will happen. There will be a gathering. We will be gathered and they will be gathered. We meaning those who have trusted in Jesus, those who have been covered by the blood. So God is a promise keeper. Don't ever forget that. Jesus will come to complete the salvation that he began in us. He's not just going to leave us hanging. He will complete it. And he will come and judge the living and the dead in righteousness with perfect judgment. And once again, today is a day to choose. When it happens, it's too late. The time is at the end. So let me just kind of just wrap this up with just two quick thoughts of application before we move to next week and to follow up these verses. Just know these things, and, and just, these are some things you can hang your hat on, um, especially in times like we're living through now. The labor out of our love for God and for people that we do in this time will not be in vain. None of it. It's, it's all for a purpose. Jesus will come again and he will gather his people. We, we don't know when. We don't necessarily know all the details. What we do know, for those of us who know him, it will be a day of great celebration like no other. Our Lord, the one we call the Son of Man, Jesus, will bring to earth the kingdom that we long for. He will come in glory, and that will cause the faithful to stand in awe and worship but it will also cause those who reject him great terror. The reason we proclaim the gospel is because of that terror. There will be people that have rejected Jesus that will respond to the second coming that could be responding in joy because the salvation has come will respond in terror. At that time when Jesus makes everything right, everything will be made right. Tribulation will end, and as we talked about before, there will be shalom. There will be real peace. Not peace like the world gives, but peace like G Jesus promises in totality. It will all be okay. Until then, we wait in hope. We wait in hope, knowing that all this will pass away. All this is temporary, even the way we worship. Think about that. Our worship, which is good and pleasing to God, 
will pass away because we worship only in part now. We don't worship with our whole hearts, do we? We don't worship the fullness of seeing him. We only worship in part. That too is temporary. That will be taken away for, for the perfect. See, God allows this to happen, to this stuff to continue, because he is patient and isn't willing anyone should perish. He doesn't want anyone to respond to his second coming with terror. He wants everyone to respond with awe and worship. And God allows all this to continue, all this temporary stuff to continue, because he trusts his church to continue the work that he gave us to do. That's why he tarries, because he doesn't want anyone to perish. Let me close with this verse, Galatians 6, 9. If you haven't memorized this verse, then this is the time to do it. Let us not become weary in doing good. With a show of hands, how many of you become weary in doing good? Oh, man. The encouragement is, don't. Don't become weary in doing good. Why? Why shouldn't I become weary? It's very weary in doing good, especially the people who, in, in response to good, do evil, isn't it? Very, very weary. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. So it's, you're going to be weary. The key here is don't give up because you will reap harvest. There will be fruit. And at the end of time, Jesus is going to come and most of us are going to sit with our mouths open if, if it happens in our lifetime. Mouths open, drool coming out of our mouths, eyes wide, and there will be a gathering. And it will be like nothing we've ever experienced from the beginning of time until that day. Jesus will come again. Maybe soon. Until then, you wait and hope. And do not get weary. Don't give up. There will be a harvest. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this promise. Um, we know even at the end of the scriptures that the cry is to come quickly, Lord Jesus. We so desire that day to come, God. We so desire an end to all of our weariness and all of the struggles that we have personally with our own junk and also with the stuff in the world and, and the brokenness around us. We long for that day, God, but we do understand. We understand, God, why you, you wait. Because you have a heart for people. You love the broken sinners like us. You love people who do evil because you see what they could be if they were redeemed. And you're a patient, not wanting anyone, no one to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so, Father, until you come, we pray that your spirit might infuse us with power and with love, with the fruit of the spirit, so that we might carry out the task that you have given us as your people, as your church, and that we would do it full throttle, with strategy, with love, with, with um, looking for the opportunities until that day where the clouds break open and you appear. That's our heart, God. We ask that you would help us to complete that. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.